So yesterday we solved systems of equations using graphing and substitution and today we'll look at another option, the third option, elimination. And elimination works nicely when it's kind of difficult to get a variable by itself because we like to do that when we're graphing or when we're doing substitution. So in this example, and we're going to stick with linear equations today, and so these are both linear, but none of the variables are kind of sitting by themselves like they were yesterday in substitution. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and try to get a variable to eliminate. And we're going to do that by adding the equations together. Now if you watch what I do here, if I just add this and then add my y's, I'd have a negative 1y, and that would equal 23. I don't gain anything there because I still have an x and a y in my equation, and I kind of want to get it down to just one variable. So it doesn't work to just sit there and add the equation together, unless I could manage somehow to get like these two to be the same so that when I add them together, they would cancel out. Now one would have to be positive and one would have to be negative for that to work, but that's what my goal is, is to try to get them to be the same number. So it doesn't really matter if you try to eliminate your x or your y. On this example, I'm gonna to try to eliminate the y, mostly because one is already positive and one is negative, so I just need to get them both to be the same number. So when I look at this, I would probably, I would say, okay, what does three and four both go into? and they both go into 12. So what I want to do is turn them both into 12s. So I would take this top equation times 4 and take this bottom equation times 3. And as long as I take everything times that value, it doesn't change it. So then what I'm going to have is a 20x plus 12y equals 36. And then when I take the bottom equation times 3, I'll end up with this. And that's 42. Now when I try to combine my equations together, my 12 y's are going to cancel out. That's what I need to have happen. Then I end up with a 26x equals 82. I'm sorry, 80. <laughs> How about 78? That's what it equals, 78. And then divide both sides by 26, and x goes or 26 goes into 78 three times. So that worked really nicely. Now, just like last time though, once you solve for x, now you take that answer and you go plug it in on one of the previous equations. Now, there's a little bit more work involved here because on substitution we usually started by getting the y by itself or the x by itself. And I don't have that option, or I didn't do that on this one. So when I plug it back in, now this is what x equals, I can plug it into the top equation or the bottom, and just because it's easiest for me here to make this loop, I'm going to plug it into the top equation. All right, so x is 3, so then what I end up with is 5 times 3, which is 15, plus 3y equals 9. And so then we can solve for y, subtract the 15 to the other side, so y is negative 2. Right, so then we have our ordered pair. Our point where those two lines intersect would be 3, negative 2. That's the solution to that system. That's also, remember, the x and y value that I could plug into both of these equations, and they would both work out for me. Now, before we get too far, I want to talk a little bit about what can happen. And we talked about this yesterday a little bit. When you have a system of equations, it's always going to end up being consistent or inconsistent. Those are two words that you need to be familiar with. Consistent means that your system will have a solution. Okay, so it could have a solution like if your two lines intersect, then you just have one solution. Or maybe if your two lines land on top of each other or end up being the same line, they would have infinite solutions. Now, as far as it's just if it's just linear equations, that's your only options. If I throw in circles or parabolas, we could have more than one solution. Okay. But if it's consistent, it's going to have a solution. If it is inconsistent, that means it doesn't have a solution. So that means my two graphs will not touch. If they're lines, those would be parallel lines. All right, so let's look at what we've got. 
Okay, so here's another system. It's set up nicely to do elimination. Let's, I'm gonna let you try this one. Well, let's just go ahead and try this one together. Okay, so I'm gonna try to get one of my variables to drop, and I think I'm gonna work on, mm, let's get the y's to drop. I guess since this is only a single y right here, that might be easy to, if I just take it times two, actually I have to take it times a negative two, so that it'll change the sign for me. So I'm going to take the top equation times a negative 2, and then I'll have a 2x. Oh, no, I won't. I've got to take everything times negative 2. So I'm going to have a negative 4x. It's going to end up a positive 2y equals a negative 2. And my bottom equation I'm not going to change. And now my 2y's drop out. But if you look a little bit closer, so do my x's on this one. So both the x and the y drop. That's a little bit of overkill. I really only wanted one to drop out. I end up with a zero on this side. And if you look at this over here, oh wait, those also cancel out and I just get zero on that side. All right, so we have a certain scenario that if both variables drop out, you're looking at what happens after that. If what you're looking at is a true statement, and so this right here is actually a true statement. Zero does equal zero, and that's usually what you're gonna be looking at, okay? The other option is if you were happen to be looking at a false statement after those variables dropped out. And the variables would still drop out, so you'd still have a zero here, but who's to say what you might end up with on this side? And so if you had something like 0 equals 7, okay, well that's a false statement. 0 does not equal, state, equal 7. So you look at your scenario. If it is a true statement, that's a scenario where the two lines actually ended up being the same line. So that's infinite solutions. If it's a false statement, like 0 equals 7, then that would be a no solution, meaning those two lines are never going to touch. So in our situation right here, since we got 0 equals 0, we should write as a final answer infinite solutions. Okay, so from here on we can anticipate some sometimes extra special situations happening where we have infinite or maybe no solutions. So be looking for that to happen each time. All right, I wanted to throw one in here that doesn't look quite so pretty. It's got lots and lots of decimals all over the place. All right, now really a lot of the times you just put the numbers in your calculator anyway, and so it doesn't really matter if they're decimals or not. Uh, if you don't like the decimals, what you can do is take the entire equation times, well in this case, since they are all one decimal place, if I took it times 10, that would move each one of those decimals over one place. If I happen to have something that was um, two decimal places, then I could multiply by 100. In this case, I'm going to take both equations times 10. Now you don't have to do this, but sometimes it makes it easier to work with the numbers if you have this. Um, especially when you're trying to figure out what both numbers go into, sometimes this helps. So now when I look at this, I'm going to try to get one of my variables to drop. Um, I'm going to work on my x's this time because I feel like I do the y's all the time, and it really doesn't matter, so let's do x's. So what do 2 and 3 both go into? Well, your answer should be 6. So what I'm going to want to do is have one of them be a positive 6 and one of them be a negative 6. So to make that happen, I'm going to take the top times a negative 3 and the bottom times a 2. So then that's a negative 6x plus 15y equals whatever 3 times 278 is there. It's going to end up being a negative. Oh, this one is positive. Since they are both negatives, you'll end up with a positive answer there. Um, 834. On your bottom equation, you're taking everything times 2. So that'll be a 6x plus 8y equals... 
All right, this is gonna work beautifully. Whoa, what was that? Beautifully for my X's to drop out. 15Y and 8Y, that's gonna get you a 23Y. And add those two together, gets you 2208. And then just cross my fingers that when I divide by 23, it goes in there. What do you know? It goes in there 96 times. Okay, so then if your Y is 96, you can take that and go plug it in up above somewhere, and you can really throw it in a lot of places. You could put it back into your originals, either one of those. If you didn't like the decimals, you could put it into one of these. Um, either way is fine. Let's go ahead and just take it and we'll plug it in. Um, I'm just going to go to the very top one, right there. All right, so then what I end up with is a point 2x, and then I'm going to subtract whatever 0.5 times 96 is, which is 48, equals negative 27.8. So now let's add the 48 to the other side, and you'll have a 0.2x equals, adding that 48 is going to end up getting me a 20.2. Then divide both sides by 0.2, you end up with 101. So then the solution to your system, x comma y, 101 comma 96. All right, so that's the point where the two lines intersect. It's also the x, y value that makes both of our original equations true. Okay, let's talk briefly about... Um, I kind of did this about as long as I could have done it. Here's some thoughts on what you could have done to shorten this up. Just live with the decimals. Don't worry about the times 10 thing if you don't if you don't want to. The other thing that you could do if you like to get rid of the decimals, but you're pretty good with your mental math, is you could think through this and say, well, I know I have to multiply it by a 10 to move my decimals over. And then I know that that would end up being a 2 and a 3. I'd want it to be a 6. And so instead of doing this in two stages, what I could have done is just taken this equation, this top equation, times a negative 30 and done both of those in one shot. Take the bottom equation times 20. That would move your decimal and get these, or really, yeah, get these values to be the same. Okay, so another option. Okay, since the elimination process is really a lot of review, and I'm assuming that once you get back in the groove, you can do that fine, I really want to spend more time on some applications. And really the hardest part about the applications is coming up with the equations for that. So that's what I mostly want to practice is how do you get the equations for it. So here's an example. It says last year you invested $12,000. Your financial advisor split the money into two simple interest accounts. One will get you 4.2% and the other gets you 8.9%. Now you got a report stating that you made $809.50 last year on your um, investments. How did your advisor split the money between those accounts? All right. So the first thing you have to look at is what are your variables going to stand for? So I'm going to start off with my X being the amount of money that I put at the 4.2 percent. And then I'm going to let my Y represent the amount of money that I invested at 8.9 percent. Now you actually had a problem similar to this on last night's homework. And so if you got that one, great. If not, maybe this will help you set that up. You have to come up with two equations that relate your X and Y. And I'm going to start with the fact that I simply know that I invested $12,000. This is how much I put in at this rate. This is how much I put in at this rate. So ignoring the rates for a second, basically the X and the Y are the values that I invested. So I know that all of the money I put into the first account plus all the money I put into the second account should equal $12,000. All right, so then I want to look at these interest rates, and I'm looking at how I earn interest. Now, since this one is 4.2%, and I put this much money in that account, so to find out how much interest I earn, I basically just take how much money there is times my interest rate. So 
my second equation is going to be talking about the interest. So I think what I would have had is a point zero four two. Got to back that decimal up times x, and that's going to get me how much money I made in interest on that one account. Plus, then I'm going to have 0 0.089 times y. That's how much money I made in that second account. And my report said that this 809 number, that's how much money I made on my investments. So that's what that should add up to, 809 and 50 cents. Okay, so there's your system of equations. Now as far as solving it, we're not going to go through and solve this today. Um, you can do that. It really is set up very nicely to either do substitution. I could get my x by itself pretty quickly and go substitute in for x right here. Or I could do the y. It also wouldn't be bad to do elimination. I could take this whole equation here times negative 0.042, and that would make my x's drop real quick. Yeah, I know it's a lot of ugly decimals, but you're probably going to your calculator anyway. What's the big deal? Okay, so right, again, we're just going to set it up for now. I'm going to try to give you a variety of different problems, and these are all pretty common types of problems that we would use systems to solve them. But I really can't cover every type of problem there is. There will be more. Um, look in your book. There's more examples in the text or in the um, lesson part. Uh, and sometimes there's going to be problems on your assignment that you can kind of refer back to one of my examples and say, oh, this one's kind of like that, and try to set it up. Um, you got to really think through what's going on to come up with your two equations. So here we go. The admission fee. At a small fair is a buck fifty for children and four dollars for adults. And then on a certain day, we got twenty two hundred people that came to the fair, and they collected five thousand fifty dollars for that. How many children and how many adults? All right, I'm going to mix this up a little bit, change some variables. I'm going to let C be the number of children. Let A represent the number of adults. And i got two things going on. I'm talking about how many people were there. So let's write an equation that talks about how many people there were there. Well, I had C kids. I had A adults. So I should have an equation that all the kids, all the children, plus all of the adults should add up to 2,200 people. And then you write an equation that has to do with money. And so if you're looking at how much money they made, they made $5,050. And that's from getting $4 from all the adults and buck fifty for all the children. So when I'm adding up that, I'm going to sit there and say, all right, well, I got $1.50 times every child, plus I got $4 times every adult, and that should add up to... $5,050. Okay, there's my system of equations. Again, you solve it with substitution, solve it with elimination, whichever you prefer. Okay, next one. How many gallons of a 20% alcohol solution and 50% alcohol solution must be mixed together to end up getting nine gallons of a 30% solution. So we're, we're mixing these two together, kind of like a chemistry thing where you're mixing them together, but you have this end result that you really want to get. So let's set this up. I kind of think of this as basically just like it was chemistry and I set up a little picture here. I've got this solution right here. This is a 20% solution. Sorry, I wrote that too small. But. And then over here, I've got this other container, and it's a 50% solution. And I'm going to pour these into this other bigger container, and I want that one to end up being 30%. All right, well, oh, and then the other thing is that I want there to end up being 9% gallons of this when I'm done. And so the question is how much of the 20% solution, oh well let's call that x, 
and how much of the 50% solution, let's call that Y, do I need to have to get the perfect end result here? All right, so just like when we did the percent one with money, we have two equations here. You're gonna start off with, let's just get the nine gallons, all right? I'm pouring this whole container in and this whole container in, and I better end up with nine gallons. Well, this container needs to have X in it, plus everything in the second container is Y, needs to add up to nine gallons. Then your second equation has to do with your percents. Okay, so what you need to do is take, well, this is 20% alcohol of the X amount that's in there. So if I take 0 0.20, times x, that represents how much alcohol there is, plus the other container is 50% alcohol, so I'll take 0 0.50 times y, that represents how much alcohol is in that one, and that should equal, and then I've got to do the same thing on my end result, it's 30% solution, but I have to take it times how much is in there, which is 9. All right, so the first thing I would do is probably go to my calculator and calculate this 0.3 times 9, which is going to get you a 2.7, and then you can go from there. And again, you could do substitution or elimination. One thing I do want to mention, though, is that you should always write a nice sentence of some sort to explain what's going on at the end. Don't write your answers on these types of problems as an ordered pair. You would write, like on A here, you'd say, oh, there needs to be 15 children and 37 adults, or something like that, or that's how many attended that day. On part B, you should write something like, and I, I totally made those numbers up, whatever, but you write a sentence like, I need blankety blank gallons of the 20% solution, and I need blankety blank gallons of the Y solution to get my end result. Make sure you're writing a sentence. I don't want to see an ordered pair on these types. All right, here's another example. This airplane flying with the wind. This is a classic system of equation problem. And it can be an airplane flying with the wind, or it can be a boat, and it talks about the current of the water. But here's basically what's going on. You've got this airplane flying, and it's flying with the wind. So the wind is helping it. It's speeding it up, and it can go a particular distance in two hours. But when the plane comes back, now it's fighting the wind, so it takes longer. Now it takes two and a half hours. How fast is the plane? Okay, that looks like a question. How fast is the plane? So we'll let P be the speed of the plane. And how fast is the speed of the air? I like to use a W for wind there, so that's the speed of the wind. if the one-way distance is 600 miles. All right, so to solve this problem, you need to go back to middle school when you learned your distance equals rate times time formula. So that's just like even when you're like driving a car, the distance you travel is gonna be equal to how fast you're going times how long you're driving. All right, so using that idea, let's talk about this plane on our way there, so, okay, keeping this in mind, we're going to be using that formula. So, on the trip there. Okay, so let's do distance. The distance the plane traveled, well, actually, it traveled the same distance both times. It went there and came back. It was 600 miles. So the distance is 600 equals the speed of the plane, or the speed, the rate. Okay, well, it would be the speed of the plane, it would be P, except that it's flying with the wind. So the wind is pushing it a little bit faster, so it's not really just going P, it's going to go P plus whatever the wind is. And together, that's my rate. And now the time, it said on the way there it took two hours. All right. Now, the very first thing I would do with that system is somehow get rid of those parentheses. Either distribute the two, 
or really and you could also divide both sides by the 2. Do something to get rid of those parentheses and then it'll look like a normal equation that we've been working with. All right, I want you to write the equation for that plane ride on the way back. Write what you think that equation would be. All right, your distance should still be 600. It was the same on the way back. You get the plane flying, but this time, since you're battling the wind, you're going to subtract the wind instead of adding it. It's going to actually slow down the plane speed. And it didn't take 2 hours, it took 2.5 hours. And again, either divide both sides by the 2.5 or distribute the 2.5, and then you've got your system of equations. Okay, last one. The cost for Sarah to start her business is $55,000, and then she has to pay her employees a total of $55 per hour. She intends to have revenue of $180 per hour. At what point will she break even? Okay, so we've kind of done break even problems earlier in the year, but we're going to kind of address this a little bit differently. And so I'm going to come up with two equations that represent her money. And the first equation I'm going to show is her expenses. Okay, her expenses, I'm going to let money be the Y value. So what are her expenses? What does she have to pay? Well, she had to pay the $55,000 right off the bat just to start up her company. But then she also is going to have to pay employees. She has several employees, but it's going to total that she's going to have to pay them $55 per hour. So I'll write 55x or h or whatever you want to use. Okay, that'd be a nice expense equation. Okay, the other one that you want to have is her, well, I'm going to use the word income because you may be more familiar with that. That's just the money coming in. The word revenue, that's what that means. That's your income, money coming in. Not worrying about any kind of expenses. It's not a profit. It's just money that comes in. So let's write an equation that represents how much money is coming in. So y is still the money, and she basically, the only way she's making money is this $180 every hour, so 180x. All right, so if you look at this just like what we've been doing, I'm basically going to take this right here. This would be classic substitution. I would take this right here, and I'd plug it in for y right here. And what you're actually doing when you do that is you are saying, oh, here are all of my expenses, $55,000 plus the 55x. And I'm saying when my expenses equal my income, then I, at that point I've broken even. I haven't made money. I haven't lost money. I break even as soon as my expenses equals my income. Okay, this is actually, we jumped right into this earlier in the year. We would have just done this. Here we're showing you a way to think through it with a system where you have two variables. In the end, you're doing the same thing both times. Okay, so then you could just go solve that for x and answer the question on that. Okay, I could go on and on with these. And again, you really are going to have to look through your text at some more examples. You're going to have to persevere through these and not come in expecting me to do every word problem. You try your best. You can do it.